I think there's actually an increasing awareness mm. of what digital technology is doing to us. Mm. And I just read the other day this somebody um, posted something about that, that where the trends are heading, that in 10 to 15 years, having a primarily non-digital life will be sort of a status symbol, that you're living a much more full, rich life. Welcome to Family Life Today, where we want to help you pursue the relationships that matter most. I'm Shelby Abbott, and your hosts are Dave and Ann Wilson. You can find us at FamilyLifeToday.com. This is Family Life Today. All right, so did you see the uh, 20-something girl sitting beside me on the flight the other night? The one that was on the computer? Yeah, I did notice that. You noticed that? that? I did. Yeah. So you're sitting across the aisle, and Mm -hmm. she comes out. I don't know if you noticed this. She sat down, said, hi, how you doing? And that was the end of the conversation because she opened her phone, and she never one time stopped scrolling. The whole entire – I mean, I shouldn't have been – I shouldn't have been that nosy. She had her computer on the left. (laughs) She had that too, but she had her phone going and her computer going, and I just thought she's never turned it off. And I know she paid for the Wi-Fi. Because she was, and I never pay for the Wi-Fi because I'm not going to spend that money. <laughs> she but had I stuff thought, to do. I thought, what a world we live in. Yeah. I thought if I wanted to have a conversation, she would have been annoyed that I was interrupting her digital world. She might have been creating the best manuscript of her life and you're judging her? <laughs> I'm not judging her. <laughs> I'm just making an observation. We live in a digital time. We do. And we're going to talk about that today with Jay Kim. He is in the world of uh, the digital world in California. Welcome to Family Life Today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I mean, when, when you hear that story, is that unusual at all? Not at all. <laughs> I mean, not at all, right? I don't yeah. think it's unusual for anybody listening. No. I don't either. It's not unusual for us either because when we're on the plane, we're doing the same thing. Yeah, exactly. I, but, I mean, Jay, do you pay for the Wi-Fi? I'm not paying for it. <laughs> no, I don't pay for the Wi-Fi. I'll get no. the free texting. Yeah, that's right. Always yeah. the free texting. Don't pay for the Wi-Fi. I will download, um, you know, some books on my Kindle. Me too. Maybe a couple TV shows or something, you know, because yeah. you could always have the download feature. But, no, I'm not paying that eight bucks or whatever <laughs> I don't know. Because he's in ministry too. <clears throat> well, that's we're gonna, right. Yeah, we're going to talk about this whole thing. You've thought a lot about it. Even mm. wrote a book called Analog Christian, Cultivating contentment, resilience, and wisdom in the digital age. Um, Tell our listeners what you do. I know you pastor out in Northern California. Yeah, yeah, San Francisco Bay Area. I'm in a city called San Jose, right on the border of San Jose and Cupertino. People know Cupertino because that's where Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and that little garage started Apple. So Apple's main campus, the big giant spaceship, is like a seven-minute drive from our campus. So we're kind of right in the heart of Silicon Valley, Mm -hmm. um, tech epicenter of the world. And so that it affects uh, a lot of our folks in, in ways that are unique. A lot of our people are doing, they're making the stuff that is so pervasive in our lives, you know? So it's given me a, a really unique perspective on technology. So yeah, I, I've been there basically my whole life, been a pastor there for over 20 years. And here we are. Mm. The home of Trent Dilfer. Yes. Is it? Well, yeah, I mean, he played college ball there, right? Well, I think he has a home there. He, oh, yeah. he doesn't go to our church, but he, he I'm pretty sure he's pretty engaged uh, in a church nearby. I mean, yeah. our listeners are like, who is Trent Dilfer? Oh, come on. <laughs> he's a legendary Super, quarterback. Super Bowl winning. Yeah. yeah and a good Super friend. Bowl winning. And a good friend and a solid believer. Yes. Um, so let's talk about this analog idea. Because, I mean, of all people, you you live right in the center yeah. of digital world. Uh, what were you thinking when you're saying, okay, I got I to gotta compare the digital age with analog Christian? Yeah. Honestly, it it didn't start out with the thought of writing a book. It just started out with a growing awareness of of my own addiction to digital technology. I've got two young kids. They're eight and five now. But when my son, the five-year-old, when he was born, you know, my daughter's three, and he's probably two, three weeks old, and I'm watching them at home. They're laying on the floor, and my daughter leans over to give him a kiss on the cheek, her newborn baby brother. And I do what every parent does. I pull out my phone. I'm like, this is it. This is my Instagram winner of the year. (laughs) I'm already imagining how many likes, how many shares, you know, all of that stuff. So I take this photo. And then I just find myself, my own, my actual human 
children are laying right in front of me and I'm just immersed in my screen trying to edit the photo, the right filter. You got to crop it right. I'm trying to figure out what's the caption to get as <laughs> maximized likes, you know? And while I'm doing this, I feel a tug on my pant leg and it's my three-year-old. So I, I look past the digital image of my daughter to my actual human daughter. <laughs> and she says to me, no more email, daddy. Wow. No more email. Three-year-old. Three-year-old. And what it told me was, in three years of life, this little girl has already experienced me, her dad, physically present, but absent in every other way, typically checking my email, that she just thought it's happening again. And that's when I knew I've got a problem. Mm. Like, at the end of my life, I don't want to look back and say, you know— I was really good about getting back to people on email promptly. <laughs> you know, I, I, I had so many likes on Instagram. Mm. I want to look back and have my kids say, my dad was around and he loved me and he cared and we played and he was mm. present, you know? So that's what really started the journey for me. I just, I knew there was something happening in me that I didn't want to continue. Um, so I started reading a lot. Not, not Christian writers, just secular writers who were writing extensively about what digital technologies were doing to us, how, not just what they were doing for us, but how they were forming us. Um, and then as a follower of Jesus, I realized the whole journey of following Jesus is about God by his spirit forming us mm. into a certain type of person. And I realized digital technology is forming me. Mm. I'm a disciple of digital, not a disciple of Jesus. Mm. So that led to a long journey, which, you know, turned into this book and much of my work. Guys, I wonder what percentage of listeners would say they're relating to that, but mm. they haven't gone to the next step of allowing Jesus to kind of transform that area of their lives. I mean, all of us are guilty of yeah. it, aren't we? All of us. Yep. Well, come on. I mean, how many times, go ahead, tell them, have you said to me, would you just put your phone? I mean, I had, I had, I feel like you're way better. I had a problem, or do I still have no, a problem? No, I think you're way better because it felt like we couldn't even have a conversation. Mm. When somebody's on their phone or their tablet, you feel like they're having a discussion with someone else. Yeah. And so you don't interrupt usually because they're having a discussion with someone else, and so it shuts down life, but especially for kids. Yes, we just aren't present, just as you said, Jay, like we're not present and they're right in front of us. Right. I mean, what did that journey look like? You said you went on a journey. I mean, it probably wasn't that day, but did you start to cut back? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just started instilling particular practices and boundaries around digital. D like you said, it didn't happen overnight. Yeah. Um, and I borrowed from a lot of great thinkers who have talked about instilling, this is an ancient phrase, but instilling a sort of digital rule of life. Mm -hmm. There's a writer, Andy Crouch, he's written extensively about this. Dear friend, he's been such a huge help to me. He talks about parenting your phone. In other words, <laughs> treating your phone as you would treat a three-year-old. So in my home, um, even still, even though my kids are eight and five, you know, the parents like Jenny and I, my wife and I, we don't go to bed before our kids. We typically wake up before our kids, but we don't go to bed before our kids. And so same deal with our phone. I'm not going to bed with my phone. I'm putting my phone to bed before I go to bed and I'm waking up before my phone wakes up. So it's basic things. You know, our phone doesn't sit on our nightstand in our bedroom. It's docked uh, in, in the kitchen, you know, in a little station. So it's simple things like that. There's several others. But um, for us, if I'm not intentional about how I leverage my phone and use my phone, then what I know is the phone will just use me. Mm. Because I've experienced it, and I think a lot of listeners can relate. Oh, yeah. You know, we don't think about it that way, but that's what happens. Yeah. So you actually don't sleep with your phone in the same room? No. I mean, that sounds— I like you say, you put your phone to bed, you dock it down <laughs> yeah. the kitchen, and you yeah. won't even have it by your bedside. Because most of us, we do this— we go to bed, we're in bed with our phones in our hands. Yes, and so most people. Yeah. Not us, we never do that. <laughs> we but, totally do it. You know, other people, I'm sure. No, we do. <laughs> I know. It's terrible. And they, so, I mean, the the mom right now is going, well, what if there's an emergency? What if somebody's trying to get a hold of me? I have sure. adult kids and my phone's in the kitchen and they, I don't hear it. Yeah. I would say just let's remind ourselves that for the entirety of human history— <laughs> Until 15 years ago, 
we did not have phones on our bedside. <laughs> so it is possible to live life, right? That that much is certain. It's possible. It is possible to live life without a smartphone and access to the world wide web of the internet <laughs> in your final moments before slumber. That is possible. So I get it. What if there's an emergency? What And, and may, I don't know. Maybe what that looks like is getting a landline and someone can call you mm -hmm. if you're really that concerned. For us, I would say the emergencies that would matter, the reason we're able to do this is because the emergencies that matter most, we would know because it it's in our home. Yeah, they're right there. It's our there. children. It's my yeah. wife right next to me. Yeah. You know, and I think the, the push and the pull is interesting. I mean, we can say that. What if something happens? Here's my phone. But the reality is you have your phone with you attached to you in that way. Something is happening that entire time in that you are detaching from the people you probably care about the most, mm. you know, who are right next to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I notice you're not wearing a uh, digital watch. No, I don't. Yeah, I don't have the Apple watch I don't watch even thing. see your phone. Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, we how are about you functioning this, right now? <laughs> I don't think it's possible. <laughs> you don't have any connection. Because I was thinking if the phone's in the kitchen, at least my watch is on my wrist. Right. And if some the emergency watch, happened, yeah. I'd feel a, you know, a thing. But maybe that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Get yeah. rid of it. Analog clocks are still a thing. You can go and get one, you know, or a digital one, set an alarm. That's still possible. A lot of people will say to me, well, how will I wake up? <laughs> Just like there's a thing called clocks. They're still available. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. I just, I don't know. We're so attached. We're so addicted. It's very difficult to imagine a life without it. So you're a pastor of a church. You're talking to Gen Z. You're talking to all different age groups of people. When you say this or you preach about this, which I'm assuming you have at yeah. church, what's the response? Especially from kids. Gen Z, has they've been growing up with this. They've had this yes. in their hands. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're very open. Are they? Very open. I think there's actually an increasing awareness of what digital technology is doing to us. I'm actually quite hopeful that when my children are teenagers and in their college years and in their 20s and, and young adulthood, I am really hopeful that um, the paradigm shifts significantly. Mm. And I just read the other day this quick little, somebody um, posted something about they think that, that where the trends are heading, that in 10 to 15 years, having a primarily non-digital life will be sort of a status symbol, that you're living a much more full, rich life. Now, I don't know if they're right, but I really, really hope they're, they're right. Digital's never going away. And in fact, you know, I, I just need to be clear, I'm not anti-digital. Right, right. You know, I have a smartphone, I use my laptop, I use Zoom and all of those things. I have an Instagram, all of those things. It's not about the technology. It's about what we allow or do not allow the technology to do to us. And we have control over that if, if we decide to, to take control. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're old enough to remember, um, you know, when the cell phone first came out. I mean, the big box. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was a... And remember, mm -hmm. I was actually in seminary in the early 80s, and I remember thinking... It was a I bag should, under your car. I should invest. Oh, well. I should invest. And I didn't. But I remember thinking this will be such a gift because on my drive home from work, I'll get the rest of the work I didn't get done. And then when I walk in the door, I'll be free. Right. That was such a naive thought because yeah. I thought that's how we'll live. It'll just help us be more present when we're home. Right. Not understanding it's going to be in our pocket or in our hand probably yeah. unless we're very disciplined. And it will, what you said earlier, I won't be present. Yeah, I'll be there as a as a husband as a dad, but I won't be there. Right, uh, whether it's email or not. I mean, have you ever done this? My phone will be sitting on my thigh as I'm watching TV or sitting with Anne, and it won't even be just email or text. It'll be a sermon thought, mm. and I'll pull it out and make sure I get it in my sermon notes for the yeah. weekend. And again, she's looking at me like, "Where'd you just go?" It's like yeah. I went to my office, which I would have done in the old mm. days, shut the door. This is my time to do this. And I come out, I'm, I'm present. But now I'm never right. really ever separated from that world. Is that your reality as well? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Even still to this day, there's always the temptation to detach myself from what is actually happening in the present moment. Because my, my brain has been hardwired mm. to move at the pace of the internet. And that's mm -hmm. another thing that's happening to us. So we're growing really impatient. Mm -hmm. We're very scattered, you know, because because we have access to so much. Yeah. Yes. We're constantly sort of 
moving mentally, emotionally to someplace else. You know, you think about sitting at a red light. You know, I, I'm always tempted sitting at a red light and it's a long red light. What do we do? It's like I usually our- just go. <laughs> <laughs> go right. ahead, ask in. No, that's an option. Coming, I just go. <laughs> that's right. That's an option. That's an option. For most people, there's the temptation, and in some states, it's a le- it's illegal to. It you is know, you now can get a illegal in Michigan to pull out your phone at a stop sign. Yeah, or ever in your car. Yeah, you can't touch yeah. in California. You can't physically touch your phone hmm. while you are in your car. But I see people doing it. Yeah. Every day yeah. at stoplights yes. all the time, right? Right, And it's because there's something in us that cannot, cannot be still in place anymore. Mm. There was a time, you know, everyone listening to this, hopefully they can remember, <laughs> there was a time where at a red... At a red light, <laughs> we would enter a brief little season of time, a moment of time that was called boredom. <laughs> and you're talking about yeah. sermons. You yeah. know, it's really interesting for me, when I really think about it, yes, sometimes there's these beautiful sort of, I see something or I hear something. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got to remember that. Yeah. And I capture it. But my best thoughts usually come when I'm when it's quiet and boring. Mm. And my mind and my heart have enough space to just be still. Mm. And that that creates the room for God to start filling us with whatever, you know? And th- yeah, I think we have to learn to embrace boredom again mm. um, because I, I do think boredom is the path to creativity and beauty. And um, we just, we so rarely get there because we're constantly distracted. I'm thinking about the lines that we are all in. Like if you're in a return line at a store, if yep. you're in a, you're at Disney yeah. or Universal and you're in line, all of us are bored and so we're on our yes. phones all the time. But I was thinking the other day, I walked and a lot of times when I walk, I'll listen to the word, I'll listen yeah. to a podcast. And I've gotten in this habit lately it used to be my best prayer time mm. because there's just silence. You don't have anything with you. You're just walking. Yeah. And so I've realized like, man, that intimate time with Jesus, I can get locked up and totally encamped in this great podcast. And I've never talked to the Lord in 45 minutes or whatever. Yeah. And I've realized lately I've been just thinking, okay, I'm going to take 30 minutes and all I'm going to do is walk. Yeah. I'm going to pray. I'm going to listen And you're right, Jay, like there's no creativity when all we're doing is inputting constantly. So that's been really beneficial to me. But I love that you're kind of, you're convincing us, (laughs) you know, because you've studied it a lot and you've seen what's happened and how it's forming us. Well, talk about this. Is it a um, escape? Mm. Because when you say that, there's part of me is like, uh, we're uncomfortable with silence. We're uncomfortable with thinking deeply. Yeah. We're uncomfortable we, in relationships. We escape yeah. it. Uh, if Anne wants to talk, it's easy for me to go, I don't want to go there. I'm just going to, you know. Right. I think in a marriage, it can be a distraction that we use to not engage. Yeah. As I as I sat beside that young lady on the plane, I thought, she doesn't want to talk. Right. And if I turned and said, hey, so where are you going, which I rarely do, it would have been an intrusion into her digital world that yeah. she didn't want. It was her way of saying, I'm closing off you and everybody else. I think we do the same thing in our marriage. Is that something you found? Is yeah. it an escape? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we create little bubbles around ourselves. Mm. So go to any coffee shop these days. Um, they're, you know, again, pre-smartphone, uh, there was a time when in a coffee shop, typically you'd be, even if you're there for long extended periods of time, typically you are working or having a conversation with a friend with the background ambient sounds of humans, talking in a coffee shop, you know? Now you have a bunch of disconnected individuals with these little white pods in their ears. And socially, you see the white AirPods. What does it tell you? Exactly your point, Dave. It's like I you don't see the physical bubble, but these little white knobs, Mm -hmm. they're they are a bubble. Do not intrude, do not, you know, step in. This is sort of my space. So, of course, it makes all the sense in the world that all of the data is showing us that since about 2012, rates of loneliness and isolation have spiked 
amongst teenagers because it was in 2012 that we started putting smartphones in the hands of teenagers. Mm. So researchers, you know, not Christian, just high-level social right. scientists like uh, Jonathan Haidt and Gene Twenge, they've, d- they've done this work for several decades now, and it's pretty clear the smartphone has disconnected us. And we're this, uh, this writer, Sherry Turkle, has a book, and the title of it is um, Alone Together, mm. which I think is so true. Yeah. You know, you think about going, to, I was at dinner on Friday night um, on my own after I, after I landed, and uh, I'm, I'm alone, like actually physically alone, but I wasn't wearing AirPods or anything. I didn't have my phone out. I was just eating some fajitas with the ambient sound of the restaurant. And it was a full, busy restaurant. But what was so alarming to me, and sadly not surprising, is so many of the people in this restaurant were sitting face to face, but they were alone together, just Mm. immersed on their screens. I just thought, man, here you are. You're sharing a meal, breaking bread. You could be having all sorts of rich, honest, genuine conversation face to face. And you're just completely alone together. And uh, I think that's something we have to be mindful of. That's mm. not the sort of life any of us really want to live, but it seems to be the lives we are living. Mm. So you've got an eight-year-old. Yeah. When are you going to let them have a cell phone? Jenny, Jenny and I, my wife and I talk about this a lot. We think middle school, um, but we're pretty, uh, we're pretty convinced that it will not be a smartphone. Um, a friend of ours actually recommended the Apple Watch for teenagers, that mm. it's actually a great tool because you can't do social media on the watch, but you've got access to everything else you really need. Te- Mom and dad can text you. Yeah. You can call us. Um, so that's kind of where we're leaning right now. Uh, either that or just an old flip phone and she can download that game Snake, you know, <laughs> that I used to play all the time on my old Nokia. You want her to experience <laughs> it? Even back then I was distracted just playing Snake, you know, on that little green screen with the black, but it was a different kind of distraction. So, yeah, we think we'll probably do the Apple Watch so she can text and call, but not have social media. And that's another thing we're pretty adamant about. Um, and I'm sure it's going to turn into a big fight in our house, but <laughs> we're gonna, there's enough data that tells us putting social, I think, just my opinion, I think 30 years from now, we'll look back and we will look at what we're doing right now, which is allowing 12 year olds to get on social media. We'll look back on that the way we would look back now as if we had put cigarettes in the hands of 12-year-olds for sure. 30 years ago. I mean, it's literally killing a generation. So for us, um, yeah, we're, we're not going to do social media. When she turns 18, she can, you know, it's her own choice. But for now, that's kind of where we're at. She can figure it out. Well, you started the program talking about how you've learned to put your phone to bed. Yeah. You dock it, then you go upstairs, go to sleep, and then you wake your phone up. Mm-hmm. You purposely come down and you choosing when to have your phone on instead of having it in your hand when you go to bed and when you wake up. Tell us the difference that that has made for you because you said that you were pretty much present, but you weren't present with your family and kids. Has it changed? What's it feel like now? Changed everything. Really? Yeah. So Jenny and I have actual conversation before bed, <laughs> you know, not not just quippy little things. Hey, look, look what I saw on Twitter. Or, and you really weren't doing that. We before. weren't. No. no, I mean, we were both just scrolling. And and occasionally we'd say, hey, look at this funny meme on Instagram, you know? But yeah. that's not real conversation. Right. Yeah. So, um, and she decided to do this as well. Mm-hmm. You both did. Mm-hmm. And my wife took it a step further. Before I started putting the phone to bed, before all of that, she got off of all social media about four years ago. Still so she, off? Still off. Really? She'll never go back. How does she function? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I ask her that every day. How, how are you even alive without Twitter? How is this possible? Yeah. yeah, she will never go back. Really? Yeah. Because? I mean, she, she has no temptation. Um, several things. One, just time. The mm. simplicity of she realized... I didn't, she she says, I did not realize how much time social media was stealing from me. In fact, I would encourage everybody... Just take inventory. Your phone can do it for you. It'll tell you how much time you're spending on your phone on various apps. It's so depressing. Never look at it. You should look at it, you know, because it'll give you a clear and then do some of the math. What does that look like over the course of a week, a month, a year, 
10 years wow. and you will be alarmed at how much of your life does is, yours is uh, do what mine does it lets me know how many hours on sunday morning yeah is that a thing because i'm always at church yeah. yes and it's I like know. convicting i'm it's like the holy getting spirit ready to preach, this, and I'm like, dave <laughs> this week i'm like can't we do this tomorrow tomorrow why right now like i'm it just reminds you yeah this is not important and look what you did this week yeah yeah i didn't know it was Sunday morning for everybody. Yeah. Well, so, um, I think you can change it, but yeah, for yeah. mine, it's Sunday. So it's really, she stayed off. She stayed off. Huh? She loves it. Um, it's not just the time either. It's, uh, she just feels way less anxious. Mm. And uh, there's a lot of research that shows social media is designed um, to make you anxious because it is the thing that keeps you coming back. Mm. You know, it's one of the sort of neurological triggers that'll keep you coming back. Okay, like, did I get more likes? Did I get more likes? What's happening in the world? If I don't know, then, yeah. you know, that's problematic. So it's been a huge game changer for me every morning because the phone is not the first thing for me. Um, I just have a ritual. I make a, I, I pour myself a pour over coffee and I read a psalm or mm. um, a section of the gospels. And then I'll just drink that cup of coffee, continuing to read and meditate on God's word. And, you know, there's all that, all of that research that shows if you, if you do something for 21 straight days, it becomes sort of habitual. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's been true for me. It's been habit forming. So now I feel abnormal if I can't do that in the morning. And that's where we want to get. That's so you good. Know? So yeah, it's been a game changer. Those are just a few things, but there's just, there's been a lot more that's been really helpful for me. We'll talk about that some more tomorrow. Yeah. And I was just thinking if uh, a married couple listening just did what you said, if we did it, <laughs> forget our listeners, <laughs> if we did it, that's a that's a game changer for your marriage. Yeah. And I'm guessing your daughter's not coming up to you anymore and going, get off email. That's right. Because you're not, it's, it's not as prevalent as it was, right? Yeah, yeah. that's exactly right. Mm, I love it. I think that's a great application. Super helpful and relevant conversation today because last time I checked, almost all of us have a phone. I do, and I'm pretty sure you do too. And so we need to hear conversations like the one we heard today. I'm Shelby Abbott, and you've been listening to David Ann Wilson with Jay Kim on Family Life Today. Jay has written a book called Analog Church, Why We Need Real People, Places, and Things in the digital age. It's really a must read for anyone who's exploring kind of the intersection of technology and church. Really helpful insights on the implications of the digital age for stuff like worship and discipleship. And so you can go online to familylifetoday.com to get a copy. You can find the book in the show notes section at the bottom of the page, or you could just give us a call at 800 F as in family, L as in life, and then the word today. And sometimes when you talk about this subject, when it comes to technology, a lot of people can get very anxious about it. They think, you know, I'm, not, I'm doing the wrong things. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Or maybe my life isn't where it's supposed to be right now when it comes to technology. And earlier this week, we had on a really amazing guest, Elizabeth Woodson, who talked about finding joy when the life you have is not the life that you hoped for. She wrote a book called Embrace Your Life, and it really helps you understand the contentment that you can find in the gap between where you currently are and what you desire for your life to look like. So that book that Elizabeth wrote is going to be our gift to you when you give today at FamilyLifeToday.com. You can get your copy with any donation that you decide to give to Family Life. You can head online to FamilyLifeToday.com and click on the Donate Now button at the top of the page, or you can give us a Call with your donation at 800-358-6329. Again, that number is 800-F as in family, L as in life, and then the word today. And you can feel free to drop us a donation in the mail if you'd like to. Our address is Family Life, 100 Lake Heart Drive, Orlando, Florida, 32832. So how does your smartphone act as a mirror? Is it promoting self-despair by fostering an inward focus perspective with you? Well, Jay Kim is back again tomorrow with David Ann Wilson to help us understand our smartphones. We hope you'll join us. On behalf of David Ann Wilson, I'm Shelby Abbott. 
We'll see you back next time for another edition of Family Life Today. Family Life Today is a donor-supported production of Family Life, a crew ministry, helping you pursue the relationships that matter most.